to thank our FST in particular, uh, Dr. Sangenang and Dr. F. T. Chan for inviting me to speak uh, on this very encouraging, inspiring conference. So uh, perhaps I need to introduce myself first because if you look at my current title, you don't know why I'm here. <laughs> I also don't know why I'm here, okay? <laughs> but uh, my background is that uh, as, the, as, the, as our MC introduced that I have been serving the engineering profession for more than 20 years, taking up the role of accrediting all the engineering and information technology programs, undergraduate and some degree programs in Hong Kong. So I think I will be able to share some pragmatic experience that I have learned in the past some 20 plus years in terms of accreditation done locally and also how they meet with the international requirements in the context of general education. I think that, that's the purpose of this conference. So um, at the time when Dr. Fu was presenting just a few moments ago, I was worried because I have not get in touch with him on, on the topics and the context that he, is, he was going to talk about. I just worry that I'm going to talk about is completely different what he had talked about. So uh, very, very fortunately that I, what I'm going to present to you is will be in a perfect match the way you, you, uh, you have presented to us. So it's uh, my good luck. And um, today I will try to make use of an example, a specific example to illustrate the relationship between the general education and the professional accreditation requirements by using the Hong Kong Institutional Engineers Accreditation Criteria for engineering higher diploma and equipment programs as an illustrative example. How this is locally done, how it is matched with the international requirements and what we call senior court, having consists of Australia, Canada, China, Taipei, so on and so forth, in which all the programs locally accredited by the Hong Kong Institutional Engineers in Hong Kong are um, mutually recognized with those programs accredited by other secretaries of the Court. So, we have not, not just done this locally, we have also done this internationally, I mean, meeting the international requirement. So, when we are talking about the general education, we are not just think, looking at our own requirements, we also need to meet with the international requirements. I think that's very important. So, let me start by looking at the Accreditation criteria for accrediting engineering high diploma and equipment programs in Hong Kong. So I'm not, not trying to look at the, there are so many different parts of accreditation criteria. I will focus on two things. One is on the professional components. That is the requirement that the program should have the input from all the students, whether they are within the curriculum, whether they are extracurricular activities, or whether they are some student learning experience that you are going to give to the students. So you, we all call this together professional requirements. So what kind of professional requirements that we, need, we, we, we will require all the engineering high diploma equipment programs in Hong Kong to have? They, they will be maths and computing, engineering subjects and complementary studies. We will ask them to do uh, appropriate maths and computing contents to build the foundation for the learning engineering, engineering subjects and then merge with the complementary studies, which is, in a, in a sense, general education, and form a coherent product. So let me jump to some of the details. So, okay. And when you look at the engineering subjects, so I, I think we, traditionally, I think maybe you are looking, looking at there or thinking about the one is required by a profession, that what you will, will think about is that, oh, they must be looking at the very technical things, the discipline-specific things, okay? They look, they look, look for uh, thermodynamics, they look for uh, data analysis, they look for this. But I'll try to illustrate to you that this is not just the case, okay? Uh, in addition to the technical requirements, actually we will look at much more. Uh, just take an example of engine design. We cannot just ask the student to learn the engine design techniques based upon, based upon the engineering studies but they need to have a much wider considerations of financial quality, safety, ethical, and environmental, so on and so forth. These are all general education. There's a big reason why we, from where we start at the beginning, the professional question requirements see general education as an integral part of the professional context. This is not discrete parts. It's not something that you can have or you, you cannot have but it's something that is a form of the integral part that we need it indeed. And then, when we need engineering students to have an F 
every time care about health and safety and environment. We not only require that you need to have this embedded in the engineering subjects, but also you need to have made it within the integral and demonstrable components. That's what I'm going to repeat and reiterate many times that for the general education parts within the engineering programs, what we try to ask for them is that the general education parts embed in different parts of the curriculum and they form the integral parts of the whole professional requirements. I think that's a very important thing. And indeed, we have explicit requirements of general education. We explicitly require any students to have a wider appreciation of different issues so that they can operate responsibly. So they need to do management, economics, law, finance, foreign language, so on and so forth. We explicitly state that general education are part of the professional requirements. And in addition to that, we have three specific requirements for the engineering high diploma students or equipment students. The first of all is communication. What kind of communications we need that have? We need them written skills. Oral skills, presentation skills, drawing, sketching, which is engineering skills. And indeed, I think I will elaborate a little bit later is that we require our engineering high diploma students, they are working at the engine technologist level. They are not only required to be able to communicate with their peers, but more importantly, they should be able to communicate with the layman public. I mean, this is very important. This is not only at that level. In the, all the engineering undergraduate, sub-degree, and also computing appraisal requirements in Hong Kong, the same concept applies. We require communication skills not only for peer-to-peer -peer communications, but more importantly to the labor public. One story that I often talk to professors in the university is that, uh, is that don't try to use differential equations to talk to the labor people to explain to them why a building, why a building collapse. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. You, 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 we, are, we are putting a mic in front of you and you, you put down the differential equations to explain why this happened. No. You need to explain a name and answer that everyone can understand. I mean, that's the communication skills that we require for our engine technologists in Hong Kong. In addition, we will we notice that we not only require English but also Chinese. I mean, in the very specific Hong Kong context, the, the position that we place in place. And in terms of the engine production, we are requiring that they need to be looking at much wider perspectives. They cannot just look at the engineering profession themselves, they need to look at different stakeholders, what they require, what they think about, so we need to take care of our responsibility to them. We need to take care of how the employers think, how our clients think, how the public thinks. And what things that we have done as an engineering technologist, we will have done something. What are our impact to the society? So we will try to design a chair. We cannot just look at the engineering concepts. We also need to look at human economics. We need to look at the human behavior. How you sit in order to design that. It's not just a, well, just putting a system that can do a job. You know, <laughs> it's okay, right? It's, it's not okay. Right. That's very important. And now. After looking at the, all the input requirements, thank Dr. Fu teach me, I look at the input, all the professional components that are the input requirements. And what are the outcomes? Okay. All these input requirements should lead to the outcomes. So the Hong Kong Institute of Engineers have provided 11 standard program outcomes. So every program come to accreditation need to meet with these 11 program outcomes. I would like to highlight the parts related to general education. Uh, technical parts, I think, don't, don't have interest. And first of all, as I mentioned before, in terms of the communication skills, what we require is that we are not only be able to communicate with engineers, our peers, but also with others. Others are all other people, all general public, all the people. This is extremely important. We require our students to have a learning outcome so that we will be able to do at the end of the day to engage in continue professional development. That's all right. Sense, right? And then they were able to understand again their commitment to adjust professional ethical responsibility, including respect for diversity, which is a very broad area. So we need the support of general education of many diverse subjects in order to achieve that. And at the end of the day, students are also required to understand that how the impact for engineering solutions will make in the context of societal, global, 
context and also environmental substance to deal with. So that's the reason why when you look at the 11 program outcomes, the required program outcomes for the engineering technologies, many of them are which coherent and form coherent and integral part with general education. I think that's the point that I would like to bring to you. And finally, this also leads to the international requirements. We have exactly the same things appear in the international requirement in the international agreements that we call Sydney Accord. So in terms of energy design, we need public health, safety, cultural, social considerations, all that. In terms of the energy society, we need a wide range of consideration and so on and so forth. And what I would try to tell is that um, from the engineering profession's point of view, we need never see general education as a discrete part. They are always our big partner, form an integral part, a coherent part of our professional requirements, and without which I don't think that we will be able to change a real profession. I think that's the very important point that I will try to make. And at the end of the day, so the articulation is that we have the local accreditation authority prescribe the local accreditation criteria, starting with the professional components, and then the professional components should meet with the program outcomes. And these program outcomes at the end of the day should meet with the international requirements and with the general education embedded as an integral a demonstrable part as a coherent and holistic part of all the pro professional requirements. That's I would like to convey to you with my um, experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chow. Is there any question to ask Ms. Chow? Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, can you also elaborate a bit more on your experience when talking with uh, international representatives from other signatory countries? Uh, I, I, I know that you are kind of very much involved in all this discussion on setting up the international alliance with uh, accord requirements. So, uh, do you see any kind of uh, international movement, trust that placing a very uh, important emphasis on the uh, generic skills or what has been covered under the uh, general education kind of uh, aims and objectives. Well, thank you so much for this question. Actually, um, I would like to give a little bit more background. The presentation I have just made here is a uh, 2013 version of the acquisition criteria. But in fact, the majority of the elements there can date back to year 2000. So it was very early. In the very early stage when the international requirements was uh, still under consideration, the um, general role of general education elements within the professional requirements had been brought about at a very early days. And the first version of the international graduate attributes embedding the general education within the professional requirements can date back to 2004. So it's a long, long time ago. So the experience that I've had in Hong Kong locally is that before the institutions have already changed their professional program to embed and integrate general education, the international requirements already changed. So the, at that time, Back to the year 2000 and before, the Hong Kong Institute of Engineers need to talk to all the local institutions to bring to them that that has been changed internationally. So we need to meet with all this change and appreciate the role of general education in training a real perfection. I think this is a very interesting thing because uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong Institute of Engineers previously had accredited more than 200 engineering degree programs, around 70 higher diploma and diploma <coughs> programs, including associate degree programs. And in fact, the Hong Kong Institute of Engineers has an accreditation authority proactively to bring that these changes to the institutions because the international requirements have changed a long time ago. That's, that's the situation. Thank you so much for this very quick question.
Thanks, Marco. We talk a bit. Thank you, Elna. That's uh, that's really quite interesting. I really never thought about uh, professional uh, accreditation could actually consider uh, GE uh, requirements. So, just very simple question: uh, What is the ratio uh, in terms of uh, GE components to professional components under the accreditation uh, requirement? You, you, you are bringing a question that I want to talk about. <laughs> oh, thanks so much. Uh, we, we will have to touch base. Uh. Um, actually, uh, when you just saw my presentation, you haven't saw any percentage requirement in terms of a professional component. I haven't talked about the percentage required for maps and computing. I haven't talked about the percentage required for engineering subjects. I haven't talked about the percentage required for the complementary studies. It's because of with the change of the outcome-based teaching and learning accreditation. And now we do not need to do that. What we need to do is that input, process, and outcomes, right? So we expect that you must have some appropriate inputs through some appropriate process, and you can meet the outcome. And then you need to, as Dr. Fu explained to us, you need to have a program outcome assessment demonstrated by a triangulation of cost and better assessment and also indirect evidence from this employee survey, student survey, other sanitized tests and so forth to demonstrate whether the outcomes are really match or not. So we explicitly do not put a fixed percentage to guide the program that you need 20% of that area. But of course we have some hints to them. And we will say that uh, what we we will try to explain to universities that for example the general education part of the engine high level programs, you would uh, normally need, no, need around 20% of the program formation in order to achieve the program outcome. But this is not a fixed prescriptive guide, it's up to you to how to do it. Because now, in the modern learning world, they may have 100 ways to adjust that. I don't need to worry about how they form their program. They can, they can, they can have a program to not teach, right? I don't worry about that. I don't worry about that in the person criteria. I don't worry about that. At the end of day, what I would try to see is how your program courses and other learning activities and formation, how they meet and match with your program outcome. And then the kind of outcome evidence you present, whether they will be able to convince us that you are doing the good job. I think, I think that's the, the modern course account. So we don't need to, to, to try to say, oh, you must have tried to say, try to do some bean counting. You do not have that contact out, so you will fail, you know? <laughs> I, I, I don't think that this is the modern engineering accreditation will try to look, look for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Mr. Chow, for the sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Now,